again. Welcome to the front-end crash course for Backstage. So we all know that uh, front-end is uh, quite complicated, but it doesn't have to be. And I think that by knowing that in advance, this, this uh, presentation is very much to prepare you to navigate the huge ecosystem that the browser and the front-end world has. And I'm specifically, specifically targeted all the points to how to, what you need to know in order to, to survive and be able to develop your own plugins for Backstage. So yeah, asynchronous, asynchronicity is hard to reason about. State is hard to reason about. We're stupid and we should plan accordingly. Meaning that something is, is when you know that something is complicated, doesn't mean you cannot overcome it, but it's better to know in advance rather than, uh, you know, get the surprise later. And so I stole this quote from Dan Abramov. If you don't know who that person is, he's a very uh, famous person in the front end world. He created the library called Redux. I'm sure some of you have heard of that. He's working on at Facebook on the React team. Last time I checked. I will also add a few um, a few ops lessons that we all learned the hard way. I mean, it's it's priceless what's in there. So if you want to be prepared about what not to do, it, it it's also a valuable information. So okay, so the, the presentation will be split in five big part. I will try to be uh, as clear as possible. The first one will be, I'm going to talk about browsers and what they are, what they do, and what, how to use them, basically, when you develop. JavaScript, that's, uh, I think, one of the most loved, hated language, but there is a reason why. React, uh, very famous, and since Backstage use, uses React, it's a good idea to learn it as well. TypeScript, and finally, I show you, like, Backstage and its plugin, and hopefully it will go okay. So browsers, uh, we all know that browsers has been there since the beginning, like from the maybe late 80s, early 90s. I mean, the, the thing is that the spec for the, the, the transport protocol, HTTP, hasn't changed much in the last uh, decades or so. Meaning that they, they, they cannot break a protocol, they make version of it, that, and they still have to support the previous one. So there is HTTP 1, there is HTTP 1.1, there is HTTP 2 now, which allows for um, multiple streams to, uh, so you can download multiple files at once using the same connection. And now there is HTTP 3, which is a protocol over UDP mainly to uh, gain speed. And so if you want to learn more about uh, HTTP, it's very easy. You can open your browser tab, go to the network. So the, the first thing you have is this uh, HTML document. But before, I'm going to show you a bit like how does the, this document arrive into the browser. So you, if you know curl, it's quite a nifty tool. And I prepare something. It's like a simple uh, ping to the google.com with HTTPS. And you see that, first of all, it has to open a TCP connection. Then you have to exchange which protocol you're going to talk to it. Uh, checking the certificate, TLS handshake, uh, verifying the certificate, switching to HTTP2, uh, checking the user agent and uh, the con content. And you see here, you have the HTTP code that is a red redirect. And then at the end, you have the few lines of HTML that make the document. So there's a lot of stuff that goes under the hood. And this networking part is also very tricky. And you, this is what is the foundation of every front end. So now that we see how, you know, all the, the I would say, the underlying of networking a little bit, you get your, you finally get your HTML. The browser knows even the, the oldest website from the 90s will appear in there. 
a browser is always backward compatible. No API has been broken ever. This is not somewhere, this is not like maybe let's build it again to see if it works. No, if, if a, bro a website once used a feature that a browser put out there, it's out there. If it's in the spec, it's, it has to be done to be considered a browser. And so many people complain about that, but that also means that in case of a zombie apocalypse, your little HTML will be able to transmit over the wire. And if you still have a browser with a running computer, you'll be able to read it. But that's not the point. The point is like the DOM. Do you know what the DOM is? <laughs> exactly. So it, it's um, in the spec, it, it defines like, I, basically, you, you don't need to, to respect a lot of rules. They're, they're, it's very loosely in terms of requirements, but mainly the most common uh, front end, or most common web page in general, they also they all have a document type, an HTML tag, and inside that HTML tag they have a head and a body, and that's it. That's the bare bone skeleton for uh, HTML document, and the reason all those um, framework and all this front end ecosystem came to be is because writing to the DOM. Is not super convenient. It's it's quite a bit, um, I would say, not difficult. But if I show you this little, so I just have one simple HTML page here. It's nothing fancy. You see, it's like it's so, it has a lot of JavaScript. But what basically it does, it says like you can insert before or after if you select one. The thing here, you see that that is JavaScript. It go, it used this thing called document and then the query selector called before. You see a dot here. That means select me the element that has a class, that's the dot, that's called before. And that's this one. So by, by selecting, you can trigger events and you have to apply a selector to, to select the element that you want. And that means that basically now the DOM is the state. The, to make change to the state, you can write some JavaScript. On top of that, you have event that occur. Like here, you see a click. So for instance, if I select this one, this is an event, it clicks. So you have to attach code to that event. And there is all that uh, mechanism under the hood that gets triggered. So basically the browser gives you the API to interact with the DOM. The problem is, when you do animation, you have tons of operation on the DOM. And so those operations are mainly blocking, meaning that until one is finished, the next one will not start. And so th that creates a lot of problems for websites that have very big front-end uh, application. And so what they do is they, they use JavaScript to animate all that. The problem with that is that it's very imperative. It's like, if this, then that. And every time you have to go check if the DOM has changed, because the DOM is the state. And so that created tons of uh, pain for developers. And so now we're going to talk about JavaScript. That was, the, that was the, the little bit like quick intro for browsers and what they're capable of uh, in terms of providing APIs. So as you can see, this is the JavaScript reference. This is a book called JavaScript, the good part. As you can see, the, the size difference is quite huge. But I would say let's learn something from that. It just mean it doesn't mean that JavaScript is bad. It means that most of it is really difficult to manage. So the the message, and if you read that book, that I highly highly recommend you to read the JavaScript, the good part is 130 page, really great. I mean, simple to understand. Mainly, if you have to remember one thing, one thing about JavaScript is that don't use everything. That's what that picture says. You have a very thin layer of good stuff that you can use, and it's safe to use. It will, you will be able to reason about it, 
all the rest is a minefield. So, you know, JavaScript was created in 10 days. So if you had to invent a language in 10 days, there's not many things you can do, especially uh, at that time. So basically, JavaScript was a Lisp. And Lisp is, only, uh, two main, is based on two main ideas. One function that's called eval, that will evaluate a string and convert it to, uh, to code. And the second one is apply, to apply function. So you can define function and apply them. And with the eval, you execute them. So that, that concept alone was um, started in the 50s in the last century, but that's the difference between a compiler and an interpreter. A compiler will take your code, parse it, tokenize it, and make it, like, compile it into machine code that you can then run natively on the operating system. An interpreter, such as Python, Ruby, all those things, they actually compile as they read the code. So that's not the same. You, that's why you, you can have runtime errors, meaning that during, because you, you, at the moment the code is executed, is parsed, there is the, is the error occur. So that, that means that if you ship a code to, a, to the browser and that code has an error in it, it will appear on the client, not while you code it. And so that's the main uh, difference. There is advantages and pros and cons for both. But that's just the, the quick uh, story about uh, compilers and interpreter. And the reason is it's very fast to write. Like you, you could write a Lisp in actually 10 days. Doesn't take, it's not that hard. It's not easy, but it's not that hard. And so one thing that is brilliant about uh, those... Uh, this interpreted language is that they come up with a new sort of concept that you, you don't have. For instance, in Java, you don't have, well, in the older vers version of Java, you don't have first class, first class function, meaning that you cannot assign a function to a variable. You understand? This, like, this variable, give me one, is actually a function that returns one. Does that make sense? Like you, you can execute variable, which is it, it's a concept that is completely uh, like uh, makes no sense if you think about it. But in this uh, particular case, it allows you to do many things, meaning that fun functions are first class citizen in the language, which means also that you can actually return function instead of value. So you don't have to write everything imperatively. You can delay execution to, to do later. So you're in control of the execution. And so, as you can see, this is a very basic example. You can just like write a function that will return a function and call that function later. So you understand, like, here is the function that I define. Here is the, I execute the function, but this one returned the function. And now I execute that function with another function that returns a value. So you, you decouple things, you decouple value from, from the execution, and that allows for um, a lot of pattern that you can use. Currying. So that's a little bit, uh, that's how you use a first class function. You have a simple function here that takes two arguments and they add it. So, you know, it's no big deal. If you add those two, it returns what you expect to return. But with currying, here, you will create a function that will create a function that will add those value. Meaning that you can do things in step. So if you execute here, you see the parentheses, that means execute that part. This will return the function, and then you execute that function with the 20 on it. And that allows you to, to that will compute that answer. But you don't have to do that all at once. You can do that, for instance, first I want to create a function that adds 15. Just add this, and then you have your function. Then you can do some other task, and then you can compute the result. So you can prepare things so that when you actually need them, they are ready. 
And the way you organize that is totally up to you. But that's the, the basis, I would say, that's of uh, functional programming. And that will become, like, why that is useful, it will become clear soon. Callbacks. Maybe you heard of it, heard of it but uh, Node.js and the callback hell, and why they invented promises and all those things. But actually, callback are really simple. It means that since um, function a first-class citizen, you can create a function and set the callback on one of the events that I showed you earlier, like what happened when you click something. So you can define those behavior, and they get executed when the event occur. Now, you can actually do the same. This is a more advanced pattern, like you can create a function that will return a function which will be executed as the callback. And so that allows you for uh, defining the common behavior, and actually we can run that. That would be a great... Here, so what does it do? Document query selector, it will look for the ID, the element with the ID delayed execution. Uh, I, this is the one. And when I click on it, you see that this is the old time. So the time, this is the old time. So I execute and get the time there. And then this is the new time. And you see that the, the two are, uh, 10 seconds apart. So, and, and that's the beauty of it. You can just prepare things, and at the last moment, poof, the last bit of computation that you need gets done. So that's why the, the functional programming is powerful. Is It lets you manage the execution of things at runtime. But then, you know, you, you have all this asynchronous this is as well very difficult to, to manage. I put the link of uh, two, uh, one is a book by Dr. Alex Roschmeyer, and one is a talk, if you prefer video, about by Christopher Portenev. It explains a lot because now you have callbacks, which would allow you to do asynchronous tasks very easily, but there are other constructs that, for instance, back, backstage, react, uh, and so on uses. And so what, this is what it looks like. So do you know what this does? Okay. So by the name of it, it's query the GitHub GraphQL API, which is, I'm sure, something you're going to do at some point. So notice that there is an async in front of the function. So I, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide because it requires a bit of um, explanation because there is so many concepts here. So you have a function, but then you can create an async function. An async function is a function that returns a promise. What is a promise? <laughs> I, I'm gonna, there's such a long thread here. I, I hope you, you're going to follow. What's a promise? A promise is a, let's, let's call it a thing that has three states, pending, fulfilled, or rejected. So pending means it's ongoing. Fulfilled, it means that you fulfilled your promise. Or rejected, meaning it fails you. The thing is that it allows you to write so the, the promise is, no, uh, you can recognize them by the then and the catch. So those are function. So you see, oh, the, the fetch here is the API from the browser that allows you to go onto the, net, onto the network and fetch data. So this creates the, uh, almost the same as this, the curl query. Yeah? Is that a part, that's not a part of the DOM model, right? It, this is not the DOM model, model is it? The, uh, no, that, the DOM is mainly uh, 
No, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's part, well, uh, it, it's become a, let's say that it's a API available in the browser. It's, it's a well known. So there is this thing, maybe I should, I can explain that a bit. So in the browser, you, you, you have those uh, ready-made API. You have this object called window. And this has a lot of stuff in it. So all the, the window object is available everywhere in the browser. But if you write it on the back end, for instance, in Node.js, this doesn't exist. Because you, you are on a, let's say, a headless browser. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know if that is part of the DOM. The DOM for me is more the HTML and how it you can interact with it. This is more um, the networking part of the browser. But because they are like... Would it be correct to say that the like DOM the, module is on the web browser and the node part does not have the DOM module? Exactly. Okay. So, for instance, I don't want to explain inheritance and prototyping, but that is, if you see window fetch, that's the fetch here. The, the fact that I don't put the window here is because the, the JavaScript engine knows that when it doesn't know something, it check on the higher, the default object, if any of those objects have that uh, function to call it. So that's, that's the only trick there is to a browser. There's a lot of implicit uh, API that, you, that, you, that are there, basically. And so this window, window.fetch, this is the same fetch as this one. That's why fetch is not in the Node.js. So far, so good? All right. So let's continue. This fetch is going through the network, is making a request, doing uh, the, the, the operating system does the, the network, the, the rest, sending to the wire. I created a body here. So that's the body of the request. The request can be, you can send data with your request. Some requests, you don't need to pass to send any data. You just say, here is my URL, just give me what is there. So that's a get. That's what we call REST API. A get is you just get things. A post is you create things. A put is a put or patch is you modify things. A delete, you delete things. And depending on which which method you use, you may or may not pass a body. So get doesn't have a body. That's why you see sometimes that the URL when with a get, they have this funny this question mark with many parameters. It's because that is kind of like considered a query. That's why it's called query parameters, so that the, the web browser knows that the URL going to the specific uh, handler in the web server, and that is passed with it so that the web server can figure out which data, which filtering they need to do on the data. So, but in this case, we're using GraphQL. So that's a GraphQL query, is the basic one that you can find. It just returns me who I am. It returns my login when I'm on GitHub. And so you need to create an object that contains a key called query that contains the query. Then, because you know JSON is not uh, it's a JavaScript concept. It's not something that uh, exists outside of JavaScript. Like it doesn't make sense to the rest of the world. It's just JavaScript. J J uh, JSON means JavaScript object notation. So it's a subset of JavaScript. It's very easy because you can actually parse it, or in this case, you can stringify it. Meaning like take that object and make it like just a string that doesn't mean anything anymore. But string are really good to be sent over the wire. That's the best explanation I can come up with. 
So then you have some always, you always have some authorization and some token that you need to store somewhere, mainly is in the header part. So you see those, um, all those things here, content type, those, those are the headers of the request. You have the header of the request and the response sometimes. So for instance, you can query something with uh, a text and you can get JSON back. So, so those things are, it's not recommended. Don't do that, don't do that. But the main idea is really like, okay, it, it's a decoupled. It doesn't have to be one way. All right, so we made our request. The problem is we get a string back because it's JSON, but not really. It's the string of JSON. That's why in the promise, we're gonna un unpack the promise, take what's inside, that's the string, and we're gonna JSONify it, parse it mainly. So that's what this thing does. And then, you see, because once you are in the promise, you have to return a promise for some reason. You cannot unbundle the promise unless you use await. So await, what it does is that whatever is on this side, if it's a promise, I will unbundle it, take the value out of it, and give it to you. Does that make sense? Is it the await part? That is the screen, and the done part is when it's. Is it, isn't that the. When, when, it, when you have like um, a synchronous function, yes. it delivers it back not as a, as a full uh, object, it delivers a, a screen back, right? Or is this. Uh, it depends. Streams are another thing. No, that's what I mean. So the await part is. Is that the part that where you haven't got the full acknowledgement that you have got the complete package? Ah, oh, um, that's why I have the try catch here, meaning that, and that's why I bring this example because it has everything in it. So you have the catch here, which means that if this promise fail, is rejected it will come here. If this, the fetch, succeed, meaning the, I got something, I got the request back, or the error code is, is, uh, is a, like an uh, acceptable one, I will go here. The execution will go here. The await, what it does is it unbundle. It, it takes the, it uh, open the promise and take out the value. That's what it does. But if you don't have, um, how can I say? It pauses the execution. That's why it's called await. It means wait for that to either resolve or finish. Uh, resolve or uh, reject. If it rejects, not by this one, by this one. If, for instance, the text, those things that you sent me back is text and I call JSON on it, it will throw an error. And when it throws an error, it's the try catch. So it will come here. Yeah. So you understand? You, that's why I, this is really complicated. And that's why I recommend that you, you look at that talk so that you see the evolution of each step. Because if you try to gather, to grasp everything at once, it's really, really messy. But just know this, await, wait, and open up the promise. But you need to, ha to be inside of an async function to be able to call await. Because in JavaScript, it's called the event loop. So the event loop means you have only one uh, execution thread and if something is blocking, it doesn't want to wait, so it continues um, executing. So you see all those things, they, they don't block until I tell him, wait, I need those data before you continue. Otherwise, it will return the result before we get the result. If you don't put the await here, 
the result will be a promise because that's what the then re return can you do a wait on a wait I'm sure it's technically possible but I wouldn't recommend but that is the, the, the main idea of asynchronous JavaScript that's why I, I show you this because this is complicated and if you create an async function the worst part is that this now that you unbundle it it will rebundle it into a promise If you have several async functions within a class, for example, mm -hmm. that means that you never know which one there can be like race conditions between the different. Well, not with the wait because you wait. Yeah, but if you have more than one, and the one, one the, is it, dependent it, on the other, or the other one to be finished before you. So there is also this uh, promise all that says, okay, I have many promises. And I want to wait until all of them are either fulfilled or rejected. So that's why I highly recommend check out that, check out those information. This is not a full course on, on promises. Like literally, you, you would need like a few days to go through, through all that. I just want to point you, okay, this is, this is the basic. This is what you need to know. And that the rest is for you to learn. So yeah, I think it's hard. State is hard. Keeping track of all the changes in the DOM is hard. That's why we, the, in programming language, we tend to use immutability. And that means things don't change. And that's the, the, why people are so like pissed at JavaScript, is that it does things in a way that you don't expect, unless you already know what's going on. So as you can see here, Let's go through the code. I create a variable that is an object. This object has two key, one RAM, one course. You see they have numbers, 16 and 8. What I do is I copy the laptop into a new variable called laptop2. Then I modify the RAM of the first laptop, so this one. And then I print them. And I compare them to see if they are still equal. What do you think? <laughs> yeah. But then I print what's happening. As you can see, laptop, the laptop, the main laptop, the original one, has two. But why the second laptop also has two? And moreover, why are those two equal? So. One thing that uh, will really, really save you hours of banging your head, there is no pointer in JavaScript. Like You cannot define a pointer the same way as a pointer in a language pointing a certain area of memory, because in JavaScript, everything is a pointer, except if you use a string. But that's another S string and the basic type number. So that's the point. The thing is that, look at, look at it this way, it's a pointer. So here I create a pointer to an object. Here I copy this pointer to another object, to another variable, sorry. And then I modify the object. So of course you have two things that point at the same thing. I never modify, I never copied the RAM, the, the object with RAM and core. I just reference it from two different point of view. And that's a mess. Like th this is why bugs occur, is you have two things that you think are different that point to the same thing. You modify one, suddenly the, the flow of the program makes no sense at all. And so immutability, if you remember one thing from this is this, immutability will save a lot of headache. It might not be as performant or whatever. I know there is a lot of, uh, you know, if you do like real high load or the front end is plenty of uh, requests that needs to be made, maybe immutability is not your use case. For 99% of your use case, immutability will save you. So now we're going to React.
Because the problem with the DOM is that all those operations, they are synchronous, not asynchronous. So if I say create me a new uh, image down there, it will block the execution of the page until this image is created. So the problem with that is if you have a lot of operation, your, your, your web app is completely useless because it will freeze all the time. And that's a really bad user experience. And if you're an e-commerce site or, you know, a casino company, those front-end, uh, those bad user experience are actually tra directly translated into revenue. So what people in like the early, the, the, the early in, this day, in the past decades decided to do was, okay, you, you see that this, um, this you have an element then inside that element you have a child element you have another element and in that element and, and this is kind of a tree right is you have a, the the root of the tree then you have the children and those children have children and stuff but those are actually data structure that are very familiar to programmer and so they say well why not have a copy of whatever is happening on the dom and do it into a virtual dom which is just a JSON, ob an object, like the same as the laptop I showed you before. And this object contains like, oh, hey, okay, I have children. Here are all my children. Those is also have some data and children. And so instead of hammering the DOM, we can do all the change we want and we let React or any virtual DOM library or others do the diffing. So they do the difference between what is the virtual DOM and what is the DOM. And what they do is they batch those with very precise uh, frequency. Because, you know, it's like the, the frame rate of your TV, you know, it's like all your screen, it's like 60 Hertz, meaning that uh, 60 times per second, the, the screen is refreshed. So I, I think it's below 27 that the eyes start to notice that you you have a uh, that is slow but and so this thing is very precise into the way it has to do this operation it's like batching those changing to the dom so that the eyes doesn't understand what is going on it just see, see something flawless it's like a movie you know and so that's the main idea why react uh, came to be is that it's a very efficient at diff making the difference between a tree and another tree. And so you, you get a very nice user experience with that. And so they even went further and say like, okay, well, I don't want to have to write a function every time I have to create uh, an element. So they created GSX. I'd say they, I don't know who they are, just so we're clear. But, so just imagine you have this is the main function to create an element from React. The other one is document.createElement, you know, h1. That's from the browser. But from React, you do that. It will actually modify the virtual DOM. And then the virtual, uh, the diffing algorithm will make the, the, the difference and only apply the changes. So you don't have to repaint the whole picture all the time. And so those two lines, those two, I would say, expression, I actually give the same result. And to show you how they do it, because this looks very familiar to, this is HTML, but we are in JavaScript. So they call it GSX. I don't know why. And so, oh no, come back. So uh, there is this um, really neat tool called the abstract the AST explorer so abstract syntax tree this is what happened when you you have a, a code a f that is like a JavaScript and the interpreter need to parse it meaning that he knows that okay if I see var that is a keyword and the next uh, word after that is the name of the variable you understand and so they, they build this tree of object of uh, data about the code 
and there's a tool to see that you can create on many languages and everything it's quite neat but if I paste this you can see that this is the actually the JSON object of that program so this this is the abstract abstract syntax tree of this and if you look at it it detects that it's a variable declaration that it's a variable declarator that has an identifier of identifier the name is element 2 it's a gsx element it detects that there is an opening element that's the h1 here so you see it gets yellow an identifier a closing element so you see like that that's how they do and what they do is is a compiler work so basically gsx is kind of like a pre-compiler they call it transpiling what they do is they transpile this into this and what the reason it works is because it's mainly data you shuffling data all day and so since you have data about the code why not you know optimize the code that way so that's where the the gsx comes into play whether it's beautiful or not it, it's a totally different topic but at least you understand the basis of you know where this come from what does it mean and how to use it so there is also and so now we we getting into the world of react right you, you saw gsx you saw why you saw how a react component it's in its more simple form a function so you remember the beginning we saw the function and how to use it and how to uh, querying it and delay the execution and everything you can also use class but I would say there is a caveat that uh, class will surprise you into their behavior uh, I don't recommend using them unless you really 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 need to uh, yeah that's just my preference I you remember the you know JavaScript the good part why it was so small? It's because class was not in it. That's you make your own decision. Um, so this is how you use you create a React component. You declare a function. Note that the first letter has to be capital. The reason is you don't want to collide because the, the React doesn't know if it's a browser element. Or if it's your personal element the thing is that it's also for performance reason just imagine if you every time for every gsx tag you would have to check if it's from the browser or not you the browser is a quite long list of elements so you say okay <coughs> let, let's let's use that convention put um, um, a capital letter in front so you see you have those props it's property properties so they, they shorten it into props uh, and this is how you pass the prop so the name here is the name there and you have your first react component and that is if you don't if you don't have anything in the middle like the the h1 you usually put something in between the opening and closing tag but here because you don't it's just this one it is the same as the closing one more or less and so this is the first react component and the reason this uh, took over the world is because they are really composable like they are very tiny and small and you know you, you can do a lot with them and it's easy to reason about you don't have to keep the state of the whole app, whole application in your head to be able to to reason about that little thing so th the beauty of it is that since you can compose them it's easy to change things or easier I would say so here you can reuse the same component with different parameter different properties and here this is how you uh, render the, uh, the component so you create an app that compose those components and you call react and say please render this and I have um, an element that is the ID root and paste whatever the virtual DOM has into that one here you go and so when you say that it means react is in charge of that uh, root 
So we call it true discovery. Name it whatever you want. You, you, and that's the thing. You don't have to. It's not a framework. It's a library that does virtual diffing. And it's really good at it. It has a lot of options and a lot of uh, uh, tooling over it. I also put a video by uh, Fun Fun Function, Composition of Inheritance. I highly recommend you watch that one. It's five minutes. Beautiful. It basically, it shows like why composition is easier to reason about and, and to change than inheritance. So composing makes things um, easier to change. Inheritance makes things very static. And so you, you're not done because, you know, maybe you, as I said, you add a event listener that listen to click. And that click, if because now you have a diffing, your component might be removed and added to the DOM. So you, just imagine you have a list. So a list of names, you have the, 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 element, the list element, and you have the, all the entries. Let's just say you add one. You have created a new element, and if you add a click on that, then you remove it. The browser doesn't automatically remove the event listener. So that's why you can have memory leaks into your browser, and you see like those apps, you know, if you leave your browser open for too long, it's just like growing like crazy and eat all your RAM. This is because of those uh, little thing that keeps bubbling up. They are, they are very small, but if you do that a thousand times per second, it grows out very quickly. And so the idea is that the, the components also have a life cycle, meaning that you have a function where you can write things in and say, okay, whenever the component initialize, I want you to do this. Whenever the component is mounted, meaning written to the DOM, I want you to do this, like go to the network and fetch something. Uh, whenever the component is updated, you might want to do, like for instance, a, a common use case is that whenever you see a component update, you want to check if the component, the, the data that you get is still the same or not. Because if it's not the same, you can, you know that the, the DOM will be um, changed and it will be, have, uh, it will trigger a new, um, a new writing, a new execution to the DOM. But what about if it's the same data, why do I need to change anything? So then you gain into performance. <coughs> so don't, don't bother too much. I just tell you that the components have a life cycle and that they, they are created and destroyed. And you might not understand when and where those, those uh, functions are executed. The thing is that this is still state, right? And state is hard. So what they come up with is that, OK, state is hard. Let, let's take it out and let's put Redux. Redux comes from the, it's made by uh, Dan Abramov, the guy from the quote earlier. And it's a very decoupled way of dealing with state. And basically, it can be summarized this. It's a one-way data flow. So just imagine your browser, you're clicking around. Those are events. But here, we're going to call them action. So when you click, it dispatch an, an action. It dispatches an action. That action is actually just a, a JavaScript object, right? It's just like my, the type of this action is click. And the, the payload is like, I don't know, whatever you want. Then we have the thing called the reducer. What the re reducer does, it reduces the state by using an action. So maybe it's easier if I show you an example of what it is. This is a reducer counter. So if you see the action increment, reduce it to adding one. If you see the action decrement, re uh, reduce it by removing one. And if none of them are, uh, just return the state as it is. So why is that interesting? That it actually creates a new state. So you have immutability. The thing is that since you have all those uh, it's a nice way to decouple whatever state of your application from the state of the, the component. 
So if your component holds state, it's kind of, kind of difficult to figure out what is the state of inside that component because they can be uh, written and removed and added and updated and so, and so on and so forth. And so once you get a new state, this state is is actually what we call uh, is contained in the store, and the store you can subscribe to it. And you can execute a function every time the store changes. So every time you get a new state, the store change and execute that function, which is brilliant because now you have the whole flow that is immutable. And so when that function gets triggered, you can call React and say, hey, I changed something. Do the diffing and go apply that to the DOM. And so now you have the whole cycle of, okay, a user made an event, you have an action, you change the state of your application, the state is changed, you tell React, the, state, the store tells React about the change, and React go and apply the changes. And so the user see. And so now you have the full uh, cycle of how, the, how this React Redux frontends, like the gist of how it works. But these days, they change uh, because they replace that with React hooks. And it's it's very neat pattern, I would say. It's just something you... A simple example is that instead of using a global state, you know, because they, it can change by everything and every time you have to create a new one, and it, they, they might get quite big, so you have to split them and so on. And so, sometimes you just want to... Okay, I, I just have a little counter there, I don't want to, you know, do the whole thing. For every line of code you change there, you have to change things all over. So they come up with the concept of hooks in React, and there are many, many of them. You can even write your own, and they are, um, it's in the React library. Like this is the, from, from the React library. It's a function that when you give a default value, it gives you an array of two things. It gives you a, va a variable containing the, that value, and it gives you a function to modify that value. The reason they do that is so that they can, uh, they, React can know when things change directly. You don't need to go through the store, and React can optimize for that. So you get much, much better uh, integration with React in that way. It's the, it, it, yeah. I don't have any opinion about it. Use whatever you're comfortable with. It, it, it is just fine. You, you, like, it's worth to learn it, but it's not like mandatory to use them. That's what I mean. It's the latest of the brightest, and it, it's worth learning, but it's yeah, not. Yeah. To keep state. So before, you had to create a class and create a variable on that class and store it on that class and then you have to create a render function. Here, the thing is that it's just function. And function are much more um, composable than classes. And so the, the idea here is really like, okay, I have some state, but I don't need to store that into the, the global state of my app. I just want that little, for instance, uh, I'm trying to think, but forms have, you know, if you have a form, it's like, is it an email? Is it? You don't want to, every time the, someone uh, types something, you have to go through all that stuff, you know, like create an action, reduce it, uh, change the store for every keystroke. So, yeah, it, it's more like a, doing extra validation on, on form is really, really useful. And since, if you don't have form in a web app, like, what else do you do? Uh, there's, there's not many other use cases for that, for uh, something you cannot input data. And so now you saw, like, the immutability for the DOM is something like React. There is many other, Vue, Angular, Svelte, knock yourself out. Um, 
immutability for the upstate, you can use reduct or hooks. But now, what about the shape of the data? Because your, uh, your state might become quite big. And if you change something in the state, how do you know that that change will be reflected in the UI and everything? So the Microsoft came up with a TypeScript. This is where it comes. TypeScript is a superset, a typed superset of JavaScript. So if you write TypeScript, you, you transpile, it's compiling, you transpile it to bare JavaScript. The advantage of that is that you have strong typing, meaning that if you change a type, the compiler, the TypeScript compiler will detect that the type that you're using is not the same as the type elsewhere that everybody is referencing. So it's really hard if you have, um, let's just say that, okay, here I pass a number, right? What is it to say that I cannot add a string here? I say, I don't care. I just want to set count on the string and then the, this will become a string. And then it, it, it's a mess because, you know, like in JavaScript, you can do stuff like, like this, like you have, I take a string and then I add one. Okay, one, and if I do the opposite also, but if I do one equal, that is equal true. But if I do three equal, is equal false. And so you have what they call type coercion in JavaScript, meaning that if you just do put two equals, it will just say, okay, okay, they, they kind of look similar, it's true. But if you do three, it's like, no, 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 I, I want to be precise. I want them to check, like, is this really the same type? And so you have all, all those quirks that with TypeScript kind of like let you know when those quirks. And so the, the, I think people like TypeScript because it tells you while you're coding. It's a compiler. It's not like I, need, I don't need to debug into the, you know, monitor the app into the, the customer web page. And so you, you save time with those things. It's it, basically you avoid a lot of typo. They should have called TypoScript. <laughs> really? <laughs> Imagine it's JavaScript, but with more Java. It, and, and that's what it looks like. Let's say you have a function that has search, and you pass a name or a, an age for if you search for someone. Well, in TypeScript, you can define a type person, and you can say, OK, the name is going to be a string, and the age, it can be a number, but if it's not defined, I'm fine with it. So that's the question mark there. And it returns an array of person. And person is of this type. But TypeScript has a type of n, right? Yes. But that, that's just JavaScript. Like, that's the thing. You, you can write complete JavaScript in TypeScript. It will let you do that. That's not the point. Like, it's no use if you do that. But, but is that the default behavior of type? if you don't declare Yes, I think so. I'm not fully sure about it. To be honest, I always put a type somewhere because of typo. Does it have any performance issues with the user? No, because you compile it. So it, it only checks while you are in your editor. It's I mean, it's if, if you use the M. I have no idea about that. Seriously, I... That's all I know about TypeScript is like use it. You're gonna say if if you're more than one person using that, I would recommend using it because if somebody changed something somewhere, you will see it directly in your code, you know, and not like oh what what is that schema that you use? Why do you put a boolean here and not a number? Like those it's just avoid useless communication between the teammates. It's just like okay, we have that type. Use that type. Here we are. It's it's convention. I like it. It's kind of like all right. It, it, you can communicate by code. Otherwise, just imagine. Here you have to have a if if this is string. If this is not null. If this is like it, it's like and you have to remember like all those quirks. I show you about the two equal, three equal. You, you, JavaScript is full of those. So they say like okay, okay, we're gonna make a new language with a type, same syntax almost, and this will gonna compile to this.
I think if you learn it, it's like a good, um, I would say, safety net. It, it might feel like a blocking at times, like it, it, it might become annoying. If it becomes annoying, just remove it. But it, I don't know, in Swedish it's ordinarela. Ordinarela? Ordin och redo. Oh, yeah. Order. <laughs> Order, yeah. But that's, that's about it, like, because JavaScript is, not, is a loosely typed language. You have a few type, like, I don't know. We can check, actually. It's, you, you do type of, uh, and then you do, like, a null. The th type null object. Like, do you see what I mean? Uh, how, how can you... Uh, but if you do, like, this is also an object. This is a string. This is a number, but then, again, uh, if you do 0 equal false, it's true. So you, you see that all, all those quirks be becomes quite, uh, they add up. And you're going to have a bug somewhere and you're just like, oh, oh yeah, I remember when you, you know. And that's why they always recommend put three equals, so that it, do you, it doesn't mess up your... You sure that what you compare it with has some sense? And so now we're gonna bundle everything together, like TypeScript, React, Hooks. Uh, yeah, that's from the to-do app. So this is what I mean. Like you, you define an interface that has props, uh, that has a, a path that is for of type routes. I, I didn't define that here, I took it from a, the to-do app example. But then you, you create a variable, and that variable is of type react.fc with the type... So th this is a generic, meaning that it's like a, you have... A, how do I explain generic? M maybe I will not go that, r that far. L let's, uh, let's keep it at that, that you can define the, sh the shape of a type that way. So FC is function component. So you see this one is a function. And so you have a, func a React function component that takes as a parameter props. Props is defined as that. That, that means that it's an object with path defined in it. And that path is of type routes. And so now you have this, uh, this, this is a type use, uh, that's a, a hook. When you see use, it's usually hook, app state. So it's of the, t th this is the type of your, the state of your app. And then you have parameter, the parentheses there. But it will return the state. This is the state of your app. And this is how you modify the state of your app. So in here, you can, you see that you have the, in that state, you have a list, a to-do list. It's a key in the object and you map over, meaning it's a list and you want to change each and every one of those uh, lists. And those lists, those elements in the list are to-dos. And those to-dos apparently have a completed field that you assign with this value that comes from this element. And that is a, a React change event HTML input. So if you have a, a input box of type checkbox, if you click in it, the toggle checkbox function, which I could not put here where it is used, but it's inside a, a toggle, it's inside a checkbox, sorry, will detect that the ever, the, the the parameter, the argument of that function is of type react change event HTML input element. It will return the type void, meaning it doesn't return anything, because it mutate, it just called this function. And this function doesn't return anything, it just changed, set the state. And the state is of that shape now. So it takes the previous state and it changes it that every uh, every one of those to-do to do are now checked. So it's like a global check 
when you want to, you have a list of stuff, and you, and you understand. It, it's it's like, and if you change something, the, the TypeScript compiler will hopefully tell you like this has changed. Please make the adaptation. It's kind of hard to read with all the types, but you get used to it. Ah, build step, build step. So yeah, because now you have compiler, you have uh, probably some CSS preprocessor like SAS or post CSS or whatever thing. Then you have image, you know, you have to optimize your image so that they render fast. You have to compress your JavaScript so it doesn't bundle up into a massive amount of gigabyte of things. And so that's why bundle R. This is like, I mean, I think if we add the time all the developer in the world has spent to bundle their the code, you, you see the value of a compiler at that point. You know, but it, it's very well done. Whatever you throw at it, it's everything is optimized. The nice thing is that if you want to start, there is this project called uh, Create React App. And that already has a pre-configured one. Like you, you literally don't need to change anything. Just go through the tutorial to see, but it's no, like you, you don't need to learn Webpack. That's that's what, all I'm saying. It's quite uh, tedious, but it might be worth it. Of course, <sighs> I'm so sure that we have full stack developer because nobody wanted to teach backends developer about course. Course is what happened when you have a front end that's not on the same domain name as the backend. You can see here. So I have an image that's on domain A. Let's say that uh, this go fetch to domain A, but because we are we are like this is this document is on domain A. I cannot fetch things the way I want into from domain B, you know. But just imagine it's a security concern. You you could host something that actually you fetch for somewhere else, which is, and so that, that's an opting mechanism. Like you, you need to to enable the cores. So cross origin resource sharing. So that the the backend will work, and so if you're working uh, with a front end and the backend is on a different domain, they have to activate the course. Otherwise, you won't be able to talk to it. And I can show you a quick example. So you cross to the origins, and then you can actually share. Yeah, yeah. They, they, that's what I mean. Like they have to open up themselves to you. So that you, the backend has to allow you to be to query that backend. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it you can whitelist per domain. So I, if for instance, I can allow your domain to query me, but not the other domain. Do you have any? Done at the code level or browser. So I'm I'm showing you that now. So I'm gonna query Google. Right? This is the message you're going to see. It's like, has been blocked by course policy. No access control allow or origin. That's because in the networking here, the networking request, how do I remove this? In the networking request, here in the response, there is no course allow, there is not the, what is it called, here. You need to have access control allow origin as a header of the response request. So the response request, response header, it's not there. And that's what the browser is complaining about. Yeah, but that's something that has to be activated. It has to be enabled on the back end. You cannot do your, you cannot enable it yourself. But is this more between the web server and the browser itself rather than the code? 
if you write a web server in code, like a JAX RS oh, yeah. or like a py Python Flask, or you know, like you need to actually add that ad header on onto the the response. And there is plenty of libraries that allows you to do it, but it's an opting mechanism. It's not like you cannot do anything unless you ship your own reverse proxy. Meaning that since this is a browser, you have to create your own server that goes fetch that request, that, that API data, get it and send it back to you, which is a pain, really. Uh, I needed to access some data that is on a service. And I try and I get that message. No, can't you just ship a reverse proxy? And so what I have to do is take my front end, bundle it into a container, put a, set up the CI CD, do all the Kubernetes manifest, find, f configure the uh, Nginx proxy so that he can, whenever I query the Nginx proxy, he actually goes and fetch the data from that service because I cannot do it directly from the back end. On the front end, sorry. And so that, that's why I'm, I'm putting this slide here so that you know about it, that people need to know, backend, backend people need to know about this. It's a, it's a debate, like people need to know to be able to debate those things. CSS is also something people, a lot of people struggle with. I think it's worth investing time and learning it a bit, like properly, and that will remove a lot of friction later because it's not that complicated. You understand? Like once you you get it, you have a few things you need to remember, and you just move on. It's like done. You know, you don't have to. It's basically the same as JavaScript. So once you know JavaScript. You're pretty safe, you know. You understand what you use, what not to use. You just you can build anything into the browser with JavaScript. So th this is the basis of uh, you know the, the actually it's not the base. It, it's very just a few features that CSS is really nicely where they really nailed it. First is the CSS variables. So before you needed to have some Preprocessor like a SAS or, you know, th those um, CSS preprocessor like Post CSS and everything, and they made it so that you it's the same as TypeScript for JavaScript. They they took that SAS or SCSS and compile it to CSS. But now CSS is catching up. You have variables. You have uh, you also have media queries. You can even set the the theme, like you, you can tell a media queries if it's using the dark theme or the, the light theme of the operating system. So a media queries is basically, it's like an if statement in the CSS. Like it's a, if it's only screen, I think you have other like tablet or, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not familiar with those, uh, uh, how do you say, I'm not an expert. I don't, I don't know those things. I have to look them up all the time. But I know that the maximum width of that screen, if it's 600 pixel, this background will be light blue. So yeah, take it for what it is. It's to make those design responsive so that you have the same website that is available on mobile, tablet, and desktop. And that allows for, yeah. The, and the thing is that with those variables, it's funny because you have to pull double dash before the name. I think it's for compatibility reason or the parser so that they, they figure out like, okay, this is a variable. And you have to call the var function on that. You can also do some um, light calculation. So if you want to calculate, to do some, like the size of this is, the, the unit thing is madness. Like seriously, you have like rem, m, uh, pixel, you know, centimeters, uh, do you, just, the, do just, just to figure out the unit system is already an achievement. And they, they mean different things in different contexts. I think there's like 26 available units type. Like, so 
Yeah, but now if you catch up with the latest, I think everybody's using rem, which is the relation of to the font of the screen, so that you can keep things like readable according to the size of the of the font. So if someone zoom, you know the the design stay the same and or the the ratio of the design is kind of the proportion stays the same. And it's totally worth learning. Like invest one two days, just go to MDN. You know, there they have a really nice introduction tutorial. It it, it will save you hours and hours of headbanging later. So MDN is the developer, the Mozilla Developer Network. Uh, that's my favorite reference. There is example. Whenever I need to to remember what's the what's that element for, what's that. CSS variable for is it supported in every browser or not? So yeah, I, I I really like that. So now we are getting serious with backstage. Whew, that was a long ride. I hope that uh, so far you understand that okay things are complicated, but they actually it's possible. It's possible to master. That's what I mean. And so first, I, I did, uh, yeah. I went to the repo backstage and I started to do like yarn install and stuff. You you can go and grab a coffee. You know, like you can come back in a while because it's a lot of code that is bundled, it, which is kind of inspiring in some in some way. That you know, I I. There's a lot of building blocks that are already there. Like you don't, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. And that's why I do this presentation. So that, you know, with the, the request I showed you, the promises, the function uh, in JavaScript, the little bit of CSS, little bit of React, little bit of TypeScript, you should at least survive into knowing where, how should I know, um, where should I uh, look for what I'm, like, it can get the keywords right into the search bar when you're looking for something. And that's the, the best I can hope for because I don't expect you to become like front-end developer after this presentation. But at least you will have a way, a language, a common language to get those. Um, you will be able to ask questions easy, easier. And so what I did is exactly what's on this. I cloned the repo. I change the into it, I install the dependency, I start uh, backstage, and I created a plugin, which is called uh, plugin one, first plugin, yeah. And so you see that, I don't know if you see, but I see, this first plugin is actually a Re React app with TypeScript. And so it's already pre-configured for you. You don't need to do any uh, messing around. Everything seems all right. You have the backstage CLI that will help you build that plugin. And so no webpack, no crazy build step, no, no, nothing like that. S TypeScript is already set up. So all you need to do is, oh, sorry, here. So that's your plugin. And that plugin is defined here. And as you see, this is how you import all from other files. So when you see that it starts with a dot and a slash, that means that it's a relative path to something here. When it starts with something else, like a name or in this case, uh, at, that's a namespace. And inside that namespace, you have the, the package called core. And those are in, in your dependency. So when you do yarn, all those, uh, all those stuff are uh, downloaded and set into, uh, repos uh, into the file system so you, can, you get access to the code. Since uh, Node is an interpreted language, you know, it just reads the file and compiles it as, as it reads it. 
you don't you don't have the compile step, but you want to optimize it. So that's why you have those build steps that are uh, quite tedious sometimes. And so yeah, that's how you create your first plugin. Th this is all the code there is, and you see it's called register root. So I'm not sure the the backend. So here I have to do yarn start. Might take a while. It's gonna build everything. And then you will see that the the UI of backstage is gonna start. Or not. <sighs> yeah, so that that's a typical thing. When this happened, I don't know what's going on, but I know how to solve it. So I'm going to remove all the dependency and reinstall it. And now I need to recreate the plugin, probably. Oh boy, there is a lot of things. It's gigabytes of like those things. It's going to take a while, but in the meantime, I can show you what the code looks like. So you can see that I have this example component. It's not going to find it. Example component. You see it in Port React. And that uh, type, that is function component. And so you see that this example component is going to take as a... Uh, it's a variable of type functional component that has an argument object. So you just pass something. And there you have the theme. And the theme is Material UI. You also have back, Backstage Core. And those are like, whatever, you want the content, you want a header, you want those things, you, you just plug them in and conf configure them. So that's the beauty of the, those components, is that they are reusable. And then you have the, the grid, you can define a bunch of stuff. And you see this one is interesting, example fetch component, because they know that the hardest thing is to actually write something that fetch data from somewhere else. And so this is TypeScript, so you have the type user, and this is like, this is a huge thing, but imagine, this is already big, imagine if you put a typo in there, you know, the error message might not be super easy but with TypeScript it kind of like figure out like okay the, the state doesn't match what you tell me and so this is a dense table okay somebody calling so as you can see that was uh, quite an experiment oh no nothing here yarn start Yes, node. What is change? Package lock. What does package lock change? Ah, I did npm install. Not good, not good. So yeah, that's uh, one of the things. Wow. Yeah, so th there is a, a few dependencies. It's a really, really massive project. I think like that front end is like one of the biggest things I've ever seen. We tend to like break things down into like smaller or separate things, but here is like it's an architecture. It's a plugin architecture. So you have the the core that contains everything, like the the theme, 
the component and that's the, that's really nice actually it's a lot of work that's been done for you and so all you need is to come take those components glue them together add the, the, the api that you want to talk to figure out the authorization authentication to the back end you're talking getting the data back and display so it's not that much of a stretch like a lot a lot of work has been done for you here and i think that's a I think that Backstage project is going to be a really successful project because every company has some kind of back office that is crap and this will like level up the place. It's like Grafana for monitoring, you know? Before that it was, I don't know, they have Graphite. Have you seen the UI of Graphite? And so like this is like next level. Yeah, this is the beginning of something that like, it will because it's open source, because there is Spotify backing up this project, I, I think this is going to be the same as, uh, you know, the Grafana did for Grafana. It just <coughs> explode into use, usage and, and use case. But yeah, you need a really powerful PC. And so you see, what it's doing now is to figure out which dependency and compile those dependencies and do those, like, I mean, we, we're almost at the level of a compiled language, right? <laughs> this is, uh, wow. You can say whatever you want, but I, I think the, the, uh, the ooh, I only have 6% left, so we're going to do this quick. Okay, what are the create plugins? Yes. Uh, or can I run it now? Because I don't think... So yeah, it doesn't work with NPM. You have to install Yarn. I'm not sure what is the best way to install Yarn. Maybe it's your package manager. Maybe it's with NPM. I have no clue. It's such a black box to me these days. I used to know all that stuff, but once you let it go and move to something else, you come back and it's like, what have you done? <laughs> Who was in charge here? <laughs> Yes, and that's the beauty of it, but I'm not sure how yeah you can you can use you can use your plugin. I don't know how you can make it work though. you understand like those quirks you see the JavaScript uh, equally quirk <laughs> there is no such thing as just in in this i t business it's it's just all about like details. There's one little detail somewhere that changed and the whole thing blew up. And so right now, I, and so that was just installing the dependency. Now I'm going to try to run backstage to at least show you what it looks like. Cash miss need to build. Yep. <laughs> but this is like a... That's the, that's, that's the main... That's the truth understand like this is building and you know what if you because they have all those things every time you make a change to your code and you have to wait for sometimes for the things to be built and this is like getting really hard for uh, developer experience success So I, I think that in a few years, we're going to have uh, going back to the roots kind of stuff where, you know, this thing has gone too far. Maybe we should do something lean. It's a cycle, you know, like you keep adding, you keep adding until you cannot add anymore or it's like too painful. And then somebody comes and say, oh, by the way, here is all you need. <laughs> you don't need that much because it's the layer of abstraction. I hope that I can show you before my PC dies. Oh, yes, yes. So that's mainly the backstage home. 
I wonder is first first plugin is there yes no this is the error that um, you should see if you have uh, yeah exactly but it's kind of nice I, I was hoping to see Ooh, explore nope I'm discovering that with you, I have no idea. This is the new version, I just git pulled before starting, maybe that was not. Yeah, I think so too. But um, what was the plugin? Yeah. So, enter the idea. Plugin one, no. Yeah, so plugin one is being created. All right. I hope it's the same. But now we install the dependency of that uh, plugin and yes. Now do I need to reload backstage or something? Okay, plugin one. Yes, so this is the plugin. So as you can see this is the dance table. Uh, so you have the example component and then you have the example fetch component that gets from random user.me so this is a plugin that fetch the data from a random user get it back put it into a, give the data to the react component and react renders it and as you see it went quite smoothly i would say so let's see if we can uh put in title where is that before Do I need to do something? Build plugin, okay. Maybe I need to restart the backstage. I'm gonna stop after that because this is the end and you, you have all the tools already to start your journey in the front-end world. I just hope that this will be useful and that you can uh, make something out of it. Like, try try it, try to get the... Hey, random user, he got it. So great, this has worked. We can... Let's see if I can do something. So you have the example fetch component. Yes, go get it. So yeah, you see the await fetch response, then the response, you apply JSON to it, then you get the data, then you get the result. Yay. Uh, that's all I had, I think. Yeah, so that's the main thing about the plugin. You see that now you know that it will return a promise user. Uh, no, okay. Okay, so you have the you have a hook that's called use async that allows you to define an async function that will return a promise, and that promise return a user array. So the 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 Square bracket means array in JavaScript. The and that's it. And then from there, 
you get the three value three uh, you get an object with three keys in it you have value loading and error and you can see that if it's loading show the progress uh, component if else if there is an error just throw an alert and if the thing is not loading and there is no error just display the value or an empty array and you have the dense table and that dense table is this one I wonder if that is the, where is that defined okay there we go so let's see maybe I can we don't need the nationality here it's so sad that I need to I don't know what I should do to uh, get ah compiling okay no. but that's about it the the battery is almost dead no. yeah we trust you power. okay we trust you good cool I hope that you enjoy it yeah very much thank you